I am Thou by Martin Buber, translated by Walter Kaufman. First part. The world is twofold for man, in accordance with his twofold attitude. The attitude of man is twofold in accordance with the two basic words he can speak. The basic words are not single words, but word pairs. One basic word is the word pair, I you. The other basic word is the word pair, I it. But this basic word is not changed when he or she takes the place of it. Thus, the I of man is also twofold. For the I of the basic word I you is different from that in the basic word I it. Basic words do not state something that might exist outside them. By being spoken, they establish a mode of existence. Basic words are spoken with one's being. When one says you, the I of the word pair I you is said. When one says it, the I of the word pair I it is said too. The basic word I you can only be spoken with one's whole being. The basic word I it can never be spoken with one's whole being. There is no I as such, but only the I of the basic word I you and the I of the basic word I it. When a man says I, he means one or the other. The I he means is present when he says I, and when he says you or it, the I of one or the other basic word is also present. Being I and saying I are the same. Saying I and saying one of the two basic words are the same. Whoever speaks one of the basic words enters into the word and stands in it. The life of a human being does not exist merely in the sphere of goal-directed verbs. It does not consist merely of activities that have something for their object. I perceive something. I feel something. I imagine something. I want something. I sense something. I think something. The life of a human being does not consist merely of all this and its like. All this and its like is the basis of the realm of it. But the realm of you has another basis. Whoever says you does not have something for his object. For wherever there is something, there is also another something. Every it borders on other its. It is only by the virtue of bordering on others. But where you is said, there is no something. You has no borders. Whoever says you does not have something. He has nothing. But he stands in relation. We are told that man experiences his world. What does this mean? Man goes over the surface of things and experiences them. He brings back from them some knowledge of their condition, an experience. He experiences what there is to things. But it is not experiences alone that bring the world to man. For what they bring to him is only a world that consists of it and it and it, of he and he and she and she and it. I experience something. All this is not changed by adding inner experiences to the external ones, in line with the non-eternal distinction that is born of mankind's craving to take the edge off the mystery of death. Inner things like external things, things among things. I experience something. All this is not changed by adding mysterious experiences to manifest ones, self-confident in the wisdom that recognizes a secret compartment in things, reserved for the initiated, and holds the key. O oh, mysteriousness without mystery, O oh, piling up of information, it, it, it. Those who experience do not participate in the world, for the experience is in them, and not between them and the world. The world does not participate in experience, it allows itself to be experienced, but it is not concerned, for it contributes nothing, and nothing happens to it. The world as experience belongs to the basic word I it. The basic word I you establishes the world of relation. Three are the spheres in which the world of relation arises. The first, life with nature. Here the relation vibrates in the dark, and remains below language. The creatures stir across from us, but they are unable to come to us, and the you we say to them sticks to the threshold of language. The second, life with men. Here the relation is manifest and enters language. 
we can give and receive the you. The third, life with spiritual beings. Here the relation is wrapped in a cloud, but reveals itself. It lacks, but creates language. We hear no you, and yet feel addressed. We answer, creating, thinking, acting. With our being, we speak the basic word, unable to say you with our mouth. But how can we incorporate into the world of the basic word that lies outside language? In every sphere, through everything that becomes present to us, we gaze toward the train of the eternal you. In each, we perceive a breath of it. In every you, we address the eternal you. In every sphere, according to its manner. I contemplate a tree. I can accept it as a picture, a rigid pillar in a flood of light, or splashes of green traversed by the gentleness of the blue silver ground. I can feel it as a movement, the flowing veins around the sturdy, striving core, the sucking of the roots, the breathing of the leaves, the infinite commerce with air and earth, and the growing itself in its darkness. I can assign it to a species, and observe it as an instance, with an eye to its construction and its way of life. I can overcome its uniqueness and form so rigorously that I recognize it only as an expression of the law, those laws according to which a constant opposition of forces is continually adjusted, or those laws according to which the elements mix and separate. I can dissolve it into a number, into a pure relation between numbers, and eternalize it. Throughout all of this, the tree remains my object, and has its place and its time span, its kind and condition. But it can also happen, if will and grace are joined, that as I contemplate the tree, I am drawn into a relation, and the tree ceases to be an it. The power of exclusiveness has seized me. This does not require me to forego any of the modes of contemplation. There is nothing that I must not see in order to see, and there is no knowledge that I must forget. Rather, is everything, picture and movement, species and instance, law and number included and inseparably fused? Whatever belongs to the tree is included. Its form and its mechanics, its colors and its chemistry, its conversation with the elements and its conversation with the stars. All this in its entirety. The tree is no impression, no play of my imagination, no aspect of a mood. It confronts me bodily, and it has to deal with me as I deal with it, only differently. One should not try to dilute the meaning of this relation. The relation is reciprocity. Does the tree then have consciousness, similar to our own? I have no experience of that. But thinking that you have brought this off in your case, must you again divide the indivisible? What I encounter is neither the soul of a tree, nor a dryad, but the tree itself. When I confront a human being as my you, and speak the basic word I you to him, then he is no thing among things, nor does he consist of things. He is no longer he or she, limited by other he's and she's, a dot in the world grid of space and time, nor a condition that can be experienced and described, a loose bundle of named qualities, neighborless and seamless, he is you, and fills the firmament, not as if there were nothing but he, but everything else lives in his light. Even as a melody is not composed of tones, nor a verse of words, nor a statue of lines, one must pull and tear to turn a unity into multiplicity, so it is with the human being to whom I say you. I can abstract from him the color of his hair, or the color of his speech, or the color of his graciousness. I have to do this again and again, but immediately he is no longer you. And even as prayer is not in time, but time in prayer, the sacrifice not in space, but space in the sacrifice, and whoever reverses the relation annuls the reality. I do not find the human being to whom I say you in any some time and somewhere. I can place him there and have to do this again and again, but immediately he becomes a he or a she, an it, and no longer remains my you. 
as long as the firmament of the yew is spread over me, the tempests of causality cower at my heels, and the whirl of doom congeals. The human being to whom I say you, I do not experience, but I stand in relation to him, in the sacred basic word. Only when I step out of this do I experience him again. Experience is remoteness from you. The relation can obtain even if the human being to whom I say you does not hear it in his experience. For you is more than it knows. You does more, and more happens to it than it knows. No deception reaches this far. Here is the cradle of actual life. This is the eternal origin of art, that a human being confronts a form that wants to become a work through him. Not a figment of his soul, but something that appears to the soul and demands the soul's creative power. What is required is a deed that a man does with his whole being. If he commits it and speaks with his being the basic word to the form that appears, then the creative power is released and the work comes into being. The deed involves a sacrifice and a risk. The sacrifice, infinite possibility, is surrendered on the altar of the form. All that but a moment ago floated playfully through one's perspective has to be exterminated. None of it may penetrate into the work. The exclusiveness of such a confrontation demands this. The risk, the basic word can only be spoken with one's whole being. Whoever commits himself may not hold back part of himself, and the work does not permit me, as a tree or a man might, to seek relaxation in the it world. It is imperious. If I do not serve it improperly, it breaks or it breaks me. The form that confronts me I cannot experience nor describe. I can only actualize it. And yet I see it, radiant in the splendor of the confrontation, far more clearly than all clarity of the experienced world. Not as a thing among the internal things, not as a figment of the imagination, but as what is present. Tested for its objectivity, the form is not there at all. But what can equal its presence? And it is an actual relation. It acts on me as I act on it. Such work is creation. Inventing is finding. Forming is discovery. As I actualize, I uncover. I lead the form across into the world of it. The created work is a thing among things and can be experienced and described as an aggregate of qualities. But the receptive beholder may be bodily confronted now and again. A question. What then does one experience of the you? Nothing at all, for one does not experience it. What then does one know of the you? Only everything, for one no longer knows particulars. The you encounters me by grace. It cannot be found by seeking. But that I speak the basic word to it is a deed of my whole being, is my essential deed. The you encounters me, but I enter into a de direct relationship to it. Thus, the relationship is election and electing, passive and active at once. An action of the whole being must approach passivity, for it does away with all partial actions, and thus with any sense of action, which always depends on limited exertions. The basic word I you can be spoken only with one's whole being. The concentration and fusion into a whole being can never be accomplished by me, can never be accomplished without me. I require you to become, becoming I, I say you. All actual life is encounter. The relation to the you is unmediated. Nothing conceptual intervenes between I and you, no prior knowledge and no imagination, and memory itself is changed as it plunges from particularity into wholeness. No purpose intervenes between I and you, no greed and no anticipation, and longing itself is changed as it plunges from the dream into appearance. Every means is an obstacle. Only where all means have disintegrated, encounters occur. Before the immediacy of the relationship, 
everything mediate becomes negligible. It is also trifling whether my you is the it of other eyes, object of general experience, or can only become that as a result of my essential deed. For the real boundary, albeit one that floats and fluctuates, runs not between experience and non-experience, nor between the given and the not given, nor between the world of being and the world of value, but across all the regions between you and it, between presence and object. The present, not that which is like a point and merely designates whatever our thoughts may post at the end of the lapsed time, the fiction of the fixed lapse, but the actual and fulfilled present, exists only insofar as presentness, encounter, and relation exist. Only as the you becomes present does presence come into being. The I of the basic word I it, the I that is not bodily confronted by a you but surrounded by a multitude of contents, has only a past and no present. In other words, insofar as a human being makes do with the things that he experiences and uses, he lives in the past, and his moment has no present. He has nothing but objects, but objects consist in having been. Presence is not what is evanescent and passes, but what confronts us, waiting and enduring. And the object is not duration, but standing still, ceasing, breaking off, becoming rigid, standing out, the lack of relation and the lack of presence. What is essential is lived in the present, objects in the past.